Good morning or well, afternoon, I suppose, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for, for joining us in the uh, community updates session uh, of the Crossref annual meeting 2023. Uh, I'm just waiting for all the participants to be able to join us. It does take normally a few seconds uh, and um, apologies for a two minutes delay. Uh, we had a, a small technical um, hiccup that we had to resolve, but we are here now. Uh, and hopefully we'll soon be able to start. All right, so we are at um, 70 participants right now. So I presume most people have been able to join. And for anyone who's still grabbing a coffee or tea, I suppose they'll have to um, just uh, catch up with the recording. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so first of all, um, obviously things, a few things that are good to know during the session and during the entire meeting. Uh, you can review our uh, code of conduct um, on our website, uh, and uh, obviously we do uh, hope that this will be a productive uh, and enjoyable meeting for everybody, so um, hence the little reminder of that. Uh, and uh, please join the discussion on Mastodon and X um, with the Crossroads 2023 hashtag. And um, uh, throughout the session, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we do have four different presentations. Uh, so um, after each of those, we'll take a couple of burning questions. And then if there's going to be any time left at the end, uh, we'll review the questions that are left and try to respond to as many as possible, hopefully all. Uh, but if not, obviously, we can continue the conversation um, on the community forum. Uh, and uh, before anybody asks, we we are recording the session and uh, all the uh, assets will be then shared uh, in the uh, in the coming days. So thank you very much. Another important announcement is on the next slide. Uh, so if uh, you are um, a, a member, of, uh, if you are from a member organization and you happen to be a voting contact for that, uh, please remember that uh, the voting for the uh, for our board uh, is open until 1 p.m. UTC, so 13 hours, uh, and uh, that means uh, that if you haven't voted yet, you still have a chance, and that um, and here we display the full slate and more information about that you can find on our site, and I'm sure you would have received some emails before to follow links through. All right. And so I think we can begin. I first invite uh, Irasha Prebwa from Data Sites. Uh, then we'll hear from Vinkas uh, Grigas from Vilnius University, then Martin Fenner from Front Matter. And finally, uh, we'll have um, three different speakers from uh, that will talk about the European Commission's um, kind of uh, application of uh, grant DOIs. Uh, and so we'll have a recording from Isabella Szyprowska, who couldn't join us today. And then uh, Nicolas and Paola will be able to give us further details about uh, why and how this system has been implemented uh, by the European Commission. So thank you very much. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, I think that means that Irasha uh, will take the floor. Yeah, thank you so much, Cora, and thank you to Cosref for the opportunity to present here today. I'm Irache Puebla, Director of Make Data Account at Datasite. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about our work on, on data citations and specifically the Global Open Data Citation Corpus that uh, DataCite is leading the, the work on as part of the Make Data Count initiative. Next slide, please. Right, so hopefully, hopefully um, uh, I'm talking to a converted audience that agrees that data sign is valuable. There's been a fantastic work over the last 10 years or so to encourage sharing of uh, research data for the community. But I think that as a community, we haven't yet fully established what's the value that we assign to data sharing. And in order to nurture particular behaviors and pr practices, we need to make it valuable and rewarding. So this also applies to data sharing, of course. Um, sadly, where we are currently in the context of, of, again, looking at research data, is that there is a lack of incentives for researchers to share and cite data. The research assessment frameworks that often are in place at institutions and different organizations tend to be very much focused on publications. So, you know, things that look like the traditional journal article and they don't necessarily include uh, data. And as a result, we have this uh, situation where researchers 
feel that they have to sell data because they have to comply with a particular po policy or you know do a certain tick boxing exercise but is they see it as a burden that will not bring them professional benefit next slide please and this is the context in which uh, make data account has been working for a number of years uh, this is a community initiative for those who may not be familiar with make data account where we seek to promote uh, development and adoption of open data metrics, really with this goal of enabling evaluation and reward of research data usage and impact. The Make Data Count initiative works on the basis that data metrics should be anchored on a certain uh, number of principles. These metrics should be co-created with the community. We need to have the community buy-in. Uh, they should be open and auditable. And importantly, these metrics needs to be they need to be contextualized. So we need the evidence that will provide that nuance about uh, how they can be used by different users as well as different settings. Uh, they make data count initiatives work on different projects uh, focused on three areas, uh, particularly developing open infrastructure for data metrics, co-creating best practices with the community, as well as outreach and adoption campaigns. Next slide, please. So for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to be focusing on data citations specifically. This is obviously not the only measure uh, that gives us information as to how data are being used, but are one of the uh, measures we can use to get, gather that information. Citations provide the link between the data set and another research object and provide us with this very clear signal that data has been used or reused in research. There are also other reasons why uh, looking uh, at data citations as uh, one step around data uh, usage information is useful. Uh, researchers value data citations. This is something that often when we do uh, uh, surveys of researchers asking about what would motivate them to show their data, getting citations to their data is something that tends to come quite high up in the responses to the service, uh, to, this, to those surveys. And also there's been some work done to develop workflows, both at repository and publishers to capture information on data citations. And importantly, over recent years, we have also had technology, uh, 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 new ways developed to capture uh, data citations in ways that we couldn't do before, for example, through AI tools. Um, next slide, please. Right, so we may say, great, we have data citations in the ecosystem. Let's try to leverage them to understand how data sets are being used. Um, the reality is that we are not there yet, that we have a number of challenges. Uh, uh, it's not only technical focus, there is some cultural aspects to, to the, the challenges we are seeing around capturing information on data citations, but I'm going to be focusing mostly on the, on the workflow aspects for the purposes of, of this talk. Um, what we see is that essentially, essentially capturing this information on data citations is a multi-step process that involves different stakeholders with obviously different practices and priorities, but we need all of the steps in the process to have the switches on and the uh, traffic light in green so that that's information about the citations or how the data has been used as part of research really can propagate through the system. And if we can do another click, um, I'll talk you through uh, some of the challenges associated with the different steps. So, I mean, I don't know if I should say no, yeah, exactly it's coming. Perfect. Um, so, on the side of the researchers who actually do reuse uh, data, they don't always cite the data they use. There is less of a culture of citing data sets versus, for example, journal articles. Then on the side of repositories, not all repositories have the, the tools or the uh, uh, structures in place to capture uh, data citation information. And also in some fields, there is a tradition of using accession numbers for for the for the repositories uh, instead of DOIs, and that's fine, of course. It just means that we are capturing uh, not we don't capture the same metadata around the reuse of the data set. Um, in situations where researchers deposit their data at repositories and then would cite it in the articles they are citing, sorry, they are writing the, the citation and its associated metadata doesn't always make it through the uh, deposit that is done with Crossref. Uh, some of the workflows at publishers are not optimized for this, and this, it means that the data citations don't make it to 
through uh, to propagate through the system, for example, through event data, the shared service by cross ref on and data side. So if we can just do another click on the slide, um, essentially what we see is that there may be more instances of citations that we are currently capturing through the workflows that we have. Um, and this is the context for the Global Open Data Citation Corpus that we are working on. This is a project uh, generously supported by the Wellcome Trust. And the goal here is, again, to respond to all these issues, to try to capture data citations at a scale in a way that we can also expose it to the community. So the goal of the project is to develop a comprehensive corpus that brings data citations together from different sources into a single centralized resource that will be publicly accessible to the community. Um, we are going to work on this project in iterative stages, but really what we want is to, again, bring different sources of citations together, including citations that come from persistent identifier uh, organizations, but also through other organizations that may be using different tools, for example, AI machine learning to capture data citations. If we can just do one more click, and I'll keep my fingers crossed that the video uh, hopefully moves. Excellent. Um, what you see on the video is uh, a, a dashboard that we have built for the prototype of the corpus of data citations. Again, this is a very initial glimpse of what's in there right now. Currently, the prototype brings information on data citations from data cited and data, but also a group of citations that have been contributed by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, this organization has developed a machine learning model that is able to look through the full text of a large corpus of articles that the uh, CCI has access to. And they have run their model through the full text of those publications to find mentions to data sets that they could then contribute to this corpus. So you get a, a, brief, a brief glimpse there as to what's there in the, in the current prototype with different visualizations and options for filter, filtering the citations according to different facets. Our goal going forward is to continue adding additional data citations, again, both from persistent identifier authorities, but also other groups who may be doing different work through, again, machine learning, other tools to identify citations and to bring all of that together into this single comprehensive uh, resource. So next slide, please. Um, my final slide is mostly an invitation for anyone in the community who is interested in the project to please get in touch. If you are capturing citations that are not currently fitting into uh, event data, please do get in touch. We want to hear from you and see how we can incorporate that. But importantly, if you think that the corpus may be something that you could utilize in the future as a user, we also want your feedback. So very much interested in working with you and again, listening to, to your feedback as to how we can make this as useful as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Rasha. Uh, so we do have a minute left uh, uh, for any burning questions uh, that might uh, that people might have. I can't see anything yet uh, starting in a and a box, so I will take a sneak opportunity to ask a question uh, myself. Oh, no, sorry, uh, I am mistaken. We do have someone who wishes to ask a question. So let me quickly um, unmute Lucia. Um, Paul, if you can find Lucia on the list and unmute her, that would be particularly helpful. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Q&A box now. Okay. Uh, so we have a question here. Is uh, Are there any plans to integrate with open air discovery layer? Yes, thank you so much for the question. The, the answer is yes, we've been speaking with OpenAir because obviously they're doing quite a bit of work in, around integrating different uh, information sources together. Um, OpenAir, we actually data site also fits uh, citations to data to, to OpenAir. So we've been uh, communicating with them. We are very interested in, in seeing if there is additional citations they may have beyond what they already received through data site that may be useful for the corpus. So essentially, the short answer is yes. Um, and we are also in communication not only with them, but with other groups in the community who are also active in the data citation space. Thank you very much. Uh, and with this, uh, we will um, move on to the next presentation. And we have, uh, I think, as Greg asked, 
from the Vilnius University who will talk to us about um, citation styles. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear, can oh, hear you. Nice. Please. So about citation styles, so I'm Vincas uh, or Vincas Grigas from Vilnius University, Lithuania, and uh, co-authoring this research with me is Pava Vizuari from Masaryk University in Czech Republic. And we would like to unravel the intricacies and implications of uh, choosing and defining citation styles in journals. And I um, uh, would like to start with this uh, quote. And it's a kind of sem sentiment which mirrors the state of academic publishing uh, today. Just because we can create countless citation styles, does not does it mean we uh, should? And uh, I just checked recently and I was surprised that we, uh, around the world we have 9,700 uh, species of birds. And uh, human beings you know, managed to create more than 10,000 citation styles. So it's quite kind of impressive. And uh, one might ask why so many? And what implications does this have for authors, uh, researchers, and the entire academic community? And uh, one of the outcomes of this huge number of citation styles is that uh, authors face a hurdle of locating spe specific styles or to, to locate them in citation managers. Uh, different journals and uh, disciplines prefer certain styles. And uh, Authors often find themselves swapping between multiple styles uh, for different projects and for different journals. And lastly, even when they identified and located uh, the right style, ensuring uh, uh, that every single reference adheres to the specific intricacies and nuances of that style uh, can be a kind of a daunting task. And uh, misplaced comma, for instance, or a wrong format can lead to confusion or worse to misattribution. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to say that it has to be a, a next slide. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't move, yeah. Can you move to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm, okay, exactly. Mm -hmm, thank you. And uh, Crossref plays a pilot role in academic publishing by registering digital object identifiers or DIs, but only half of the articles registered in Crossref uh, with reference lists attached to their metadata. And uh, the efficiency of, of uh, how Crossref uh, cross recognizes references is heavily dependent on the lessons of DOIs within those references. Mm. And this brings us to a sen essential question. Are journals emphasizing the importance of DOIs enough? Do they mandate or at least uh, uh, strongly encourage authors to include DOIs in their references? Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. And uh, our primary goal was to gain a deep understanding of uh, how journals guide authors in preparing their references. And we delved into analysis of uh, two, 270 high quality journals indexed in Scopus. And our objectives were threefold. First, we wanted to go to the prevalence of specific citation styles. Secondly, we sought to uncover how journals describe uh, citation styles employed. And fi finally, we wanted to determine the emphasis journals placed on including DOIs in references. Next slide, next slide, please. Over and what are the main results of it? our research? It us that over half of the journals in our study do not specify any particular citation style. It was kind of surprising for us, and uh, especially given the importance of uh, standardized ref uh, referencing in academic publishing. However, when journals did specify a style, APA emerged as a clear favorite, uh, and it is employed by 18% of uh, journals. Uh, after he went to Vancouver, Harvard, and Chicago, ranging from 6 to 4%. And he saw 690, and a AMA also made it to the list, but uh, only from 4 to 3%, respectively. And next slide. And uh, we set an additional goal for our assessment to unravel the mystery behind those unnamed reference styles. To achieve this, we wanted to determine if these uh, unnamed uh, references uh, are actually aligned with known and established citation practices. And uh, actually, our findings were quite intriguing. Uh, yes, there were clear traces of well-recognized styles like APA, Vancouver, or Harvard, 
however, there is um, the catch. This, these tiles often came with slight uh, tweaks or modifications, and it is taken to hearing a familiar song, but with a few new notes added. And uh, so, what does it mean for authors and their tools? In essence, why the intent behind offering examples might be to simplify that process, but the uh, reality is that it can sometimes um, introduce new complexities, especially in the age of automation and, and reference managers use. Uh -huh. Next slide. And uh, so the lack of clear citation guidelines can lead to inconsistency, inconsistencies and uh, more importantly, potential, potential errors or informatic references. So this affects the accessibility and the interconnectedness of scholarly work. So uh, from our data, only 41% of journals explicitly ask authors to include UIs. However, um, it is interesting to note that much uh, a much larger proportion, it means about 78% to be exact, actually, uh, uh, have UIs present in their reference list. But still, it's not a 100%, actually. And uh, this su suggests that we even if not managed, the utility of DOIs is better recognized. Well, next slide. And uh, the country of origin of a journal doesn't significantly affect the use of uh, or emission of specific citation styles. Uh, what data matches uh, as a notable factor, however, is the science field of the journal. And uh, disciplines have their own traditions, practices, and uh, we found preferences when it comes to citation. And there is still a notable absence of explicit requirements from journals for authors to include your eyes. Uh, next slide. And uh, going to conclusions, but uh, first and foremost, uh, need is for more standard, standardized approach. At the very least, or clear or consistent guidelines, actually. Emphasizing the eyes inclusion in references will undoubtedly, prob probably, elevate the quality and readability, uh, reliability of scholarly communication. But simply having tools and guidelines isn't enough, probably. And uh, there is a pressing need to educate both journals and authors about the best practices. And uh, we have covered it out of ground uh, today, touching upon the co complexities and challenges, actually. And so it's clear that we have some, you know, to find some solutions related to citation styles and scholarly journals. Next slide. And uh, final, I'd like uh, to open the floor for the of your discussions if you have one. And thank you for the attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vintas. Uh, we have a first question for you. Uh, Ryan and Miller uh, is asking, when you say journals don't specify a style, do you mean they don't give any citation guidance or that they use their own custom formatting rather than a standard style? Mm -hmm. What we were looking for, it was a, co a clear indication what kind of styles they are using. For instance, journals have to say that we are using, employing, etc., et APA, Harvard, or whatever. But usually when it's a name, it is means, yes, they provide examples. But when we uh, analyze those examples, we found that those examples doesn't follow strictly some certain citation styles, APA, Harvard, or something. It means if you want to employ let's say reference manager, you don't know what kind of style you have to employ, to use, yes, one aspect. And another, uh, when you're using reference manager, usually they work strictly following the rules of some citation style, for instance, APA. But those examples shows that you have to use uh, or to write the references a bit differently than uh, required in APA citation style guide. So. Thank you, Vincent. Um, Ginny, did you have anything to add to that? No, maybe it's just a sign that this has been uh, answered. Are there any other questions for uh, Vincent about citation styles? You can also raise your hand. We still have one minute left to ask a question and then we can move to the next presentation. I've seen already uh, on social media that some people have commented on your comparison between the number of bird species and the number of different citation styles, which is okay. mind-boggling. Maybe I made, made a mistake, but you know, I checked in actually Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, less bird species around the world and we have managed to create those 
<laughs> styles, you know. This is um, quite overwhelming. All right, thank you, Vincent, for uh, ch uh, for sharing this with us, and uh, we will now hear from uh, Martin Brenner from Front Manor. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see the slide and can you hear me fine? Yeah, all looks great. Um, the next seven minutes, I will talk about um, scholarly blogs and um, the question whether we need DOI registration for scholarly blogs. I mean, scholarly blogs have been around for probably at least 20 years, have been very popular, more so in the early 2000s than today. But there's a massive corpus, but they don't really use persistent identifiers. They don't really care about long-time archiving. So there is a gap in making them part of the scholarly record. And I set out uh, in this year to um, explore whether it's technically feasible to assign DOIs to blog posts, whether it's financially um, reasonable and whether there's interest. And I started with something which I called a rogue scholar um, to go about that. And I will talk to you um, next few minutes uh, what I learned. Can you advance the slide? Um, this is... This is all taken from a poster, so I can probably skip this. Um, what is important that I decided to, um, that blogs can use a number of technical platforms. WordPress is probably the most popular, but there are uh, many other platforms that people use. Um, but a core component is RSS feeds, which make it very easy to uh, collect metadata timely and to, um, um, use them for DOI registration. Um, next slide. Um, blog posts uh, are basically a technology, but of course there are use cases that are better fit for this uh, technology platform than others. And what I have found um, is that one typical use case is individual researchers that self-publish their work or provide feedback on their published work. And some of them have been doing this for 10, 15 years. Another uh, use case is uh, emergent efforts where you don't really feel ready to start a journal platform because you are just in the early stages. And there are examples um, of blogs that are widely read and used, but uh, prefer to use blogging software for instead of journal publishing platforms. Um, another use case is um, context provided, um, for example, um, for preprints data set software, which are published, but it's it's just research. So we, the preprint servers and uh, data repositories don't really have a place to have editorials, perspective, etc. That's a common feature. And lastly, um, blogs are a good use case for grant funded projects. And I have uh, two examples of doing just that in, in Rogue Scholar. Next slide. So this is just a brief summary of what I did this year. Um, I can probably um, cut this short, but basically um, I announced this project and uh, raised interest and in, in April started registering blocks, um, where the key feature is that I was using RSS feeds or Atom and JSON feed feeds. And in June, I started UI registration. Um, and um, what I learned uh, more recently is that um, several blocks use APIs, for example, WordPress or Ghost, um, which makes it much easier to harvest metadata. And uh, last month, or actually this month, I launched an API because um, the initial platform was really not, not so good for handling more complicated um, API calls. Next slide. So what I learned is that it's feasible, cost-effective, and there is interest by bloggers. 
Um, as of this week, I have uh, 65 blogs participating, um, close to 10,000 blog posts that have DOIs. Um, they use 12 different technical platforms. Again, WordPress being the most popular, they are written in four languages. The majority is in English, but we also have German, Spanish, and French. And this all happened in the last six months. So I feel there is interest and this is feasible. Um, what is important is that all these blocks existed before and I don't require any technical work, but it's just integrating existing blocks. Um, and this is very feasible. What is also important that the URI registration doesn't mean um, just the minimum metadata, but um, we have a number of things that are very easy with blogging platforms, for example, licenses, abstracts, language, ORCID IDs. Something that's more difficult and that's something I'm working on is reference and relationships. We have um, about 10% of blog posts have reference in their metadata registered with Crossref, and a few have relationships. Typically, that's either translation, so where blog posts are translated in different languages, or they are hosted on different um, platforms uh, for an identical relationship. For example, the blog has also uh, uploaded a PDF to Zenodo repository. That's a typical use case. Um, because um, I required the full text of blog posts and open license, it was easy to extract additional metadata and also um, to allow up other people to do that. Next slide, please. So just briefly, the future work. One is um, I, I have um, worked with Internet Archive to provide a long-term archiving solution and actually have signed a contract that starts tomorrow. So all these blocks that are participating will be archived in Internet Archive using their archive it service. I have been doing work on improving the API, which is helpful not only for the service, but also for external users that want to reuse um, content from the blog post. And I have started working with the Nodo repository to work on other outputs formats, for example, PDF and EPUB. And the final slide, which I think a community session should have a wish list for Crosstaff, and there's there's not a lot of things. Um, the, the main, sort of the first issue is about um, sponsorship, because many blogs are either individual people or small organizations, so they would really benefit from sponsorship um, rather than all becoming CrossF members themselves. It would be nice if, I mean, I'm using the posted content content type, but it would be nice if there's a subtype blog post because the number of blog posts is really uh, growing strongly and it might be easier to discover them if there's a dedicated subtype. There is some work needed around um, container names and container IDs, meaning the blog name and the blog ID, which is a little bit tricky with posted content. And one metadata feature that's very common in blogs um, is called featured image, which would be nice um, if as an optional metadata feature, because that's usually what, together with the abstract, what people read first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Uh, great. Um, good experimentation, and thank you for making a case for the um, for for the DOIs for science uh, for scholarly blogs. Uh, if I can um, just ask if there are any other questions, we still have um, a couple of minutes. If people have burning questions around uh, scholarly blogs and. Uh, um, identifiers, the uh, persistent identifiers for them. All right. Well, if you have any questions for Martin later, do please still put them in the Q and A box, um, and uh, we'll start. Uh, we'll try to come back to it uh, uh, after the last presentation. So do. 
um, do feel free to ask a bit later. Obviously, you can try and test the um, the, the tools that Martin has referred to. And uh, I just wanted to remind you that there is um, that there is also a poster in our forum uh, in our forum where you can uh, see all that information and engage with it again and ask more questions of Martin too. So uh, I will be sharing that link with you momentarily. And in the meantime, I would like to invite uh, our next uh, group of speakers. Uh, so this uh, is a collaborative presentation between uh, a few different players. Obviously, it was an immense effort to apply uh, grant DOIs uh, in, um, for the European Commission. Uh, so the um, so basically, uh, Isabella Fikrovska has uh, given us a video uh, presentation, uh, which I'll uh, make available in a second, and then her colleagues will follow up with a few more details on slides. Uh, so if we can put on the next slide momentarily whilst I get the video going, uh, I will now start sharing my screen instead. Yes, and we want the video. Here we go. I hope you can now see the video and soon it will be revealed if the uh, if the audio is also audible. So let's give it a go. Hello, my name is Isabella Szyprowska. I'm representing the Publications Office of the European Union. Today I want to tell you how the Office has recently implemented a system that allows a registration of DOIs for grants which are awarded to projects under the EU's framework programs for research and innovation. I'm sorry I cannot be present at the meeting, but my colleagues Nikos and Paola will be there to answer your questions. First, I will give you short background information of who we are. The Publications Office of the European Union is an inter-institutional service of the European institutions administratively attached to the European Commission. We are the official provider of data, information knowledge management services and publishing services to all European Union institutions, agencies and bodies. We serve as the central point of access to all kinds of EU official information, including EU law, publications, open data, but also to EU funded research projects and their results. If you're looking for the information about EU research projects funded by the EU research programs and for their results, you will find it on the CORDIS website. CORDIS offers a rich and structured public repository with comprehensive project information, such as project fact sheets, participants, reports, deliverables, and links to open access publications. CORDIS cooperates very closely with RTD, the Commission Department responsible for the EU's research and innovation policy. Back in 2020, they have approached us with an idea that the grants awarded to projects stored in the CORDIS repository and published on the website could automatically receive a DOI identifier in, in a business-to-business -business logic. My colleague Nikos will tell you later a bit more what led the European Commission to take this step. They've come to us because the Publications Office, as part of its official remit, is the designated central point for allocating international identifiers to all types of EU content. For more than 20 years, the Publications Office has been an officially recognized agency for ISBN and ISSN. And since 2004, it acts as a registration agency of the International DOI Foundation and has an exclusive competence for content produced by the EU institutions, agencies and bodies. As the DOI registration agency, we assign DOIs to different types of EU content, monographs, journal articles and data sets. Extending our DOI infrastructure to grants was for us a natural step. For all these types of content, we provide our own DOI service. The DOIs are registered with us as we are the responsible 
registration agency, but we also act in a partnership with DataSite in case of datasets and with Crossref for the other content to create a living network of information. In these cases, we share the metadata of our DOIs with DataSite and Crossref so that they become part of the same ecosystem. What did we have to do? We have extended our DOI registration infrastructure and implemented a new registration format. The DOI registration is executed in business-to-business -business environment via the REST API web service. DOI's metadata is stored in our registration system, but at the same time, it is deposited with Crossref, following the model already in place for publications and journal articles. This interoperability layer is an example of cooperation so that the needs of both Publications Office and Crossref are met. Given the Publications Office mission, all interactions were done within the OP ecosystem. The implementation covered the definition of our DOI registration schema for grants, the analysis of Crossref schema for grants and the matching it with CORDIS data and requirements, and the extension of our DOI registration system, including the development or extension of different components. Now about the main challenges. As you know, the European Union is a very big funder. So the first big step was to have the many funding lines to be included in the funder registry. The big challenge was also to map the internal data about grants held by CORDIS to the metadata needed by the grant DOIs and the cross of grant schema. So there was a discussion on the semantics and the relevance of metadata. The cross ref schema also had to be adapted to the specific EU requirements. For example, to take into account a personal data protection or to enable registration of non-personal grant IDs. So grants linked to an organization. All these required discussions at the funders community level at Crossref. Finally, we also had to define the internal workflow at Cordis so that the data was exported and the OIs minted at a specific moment during the life cycle of EU funding. Anyway, my colleague Paula from Medra can give you more details about the technical implementation. Since the system extension in 2022, we have registered more than 40,000 grants. The number includes more than 30,000 for grants under the Horizon 2020 EU framework program, which should be already fully covered, and around 9,000 for the new Horizon Europe program, for which grant DOIs are being minted as new grants are signed, so the number is constantly growing. Discussions are also held on issuing grant DOIs for the previous FP7 program. The DOA grant number in the DOI address redirects to the CODIS website, where you will find a very detailed data about the project, cost, funding program, participants, and the results. The grand DOIs help to cross-link with research outputs funded, such as publications, and to keep track of the funding distribution per funding lines, so a relation between a funder ID and a grant ID. My colleague Nikos from the Research Department of the European Commission will now tell you why they wanted to assign DOIs for the EU grants. And if at the end of his presentation you have more questions on the technical aspects of the implementation, Paola from Medra, our technical contractor, is with you today and can give you more details. If you have any more questions, you can always contact our DOI service or the CODI service at the Publications Office. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much. So that was uh, Isabella Fabrowska. And uh, next uh, we'll have Nikolaos Mitrakis uh, from the European Commission to share, uh, sharing a few uh, slides as well and talking about the rationale. I just want to also apologize that there has been a misspelling in Isabella's last name on our slide. So um, it has now been corrected and uh, we can move on. And uh, can we skip to Nikolaos? 
slides. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cora. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Well, uh, Isabel explained quite well, I have to say, I'm amazed from the way that she presented how we implemented the system in order to uh, have a dose for grants. But I'm going to explain a little bit of why we uh, decided to move to this direction. Uh, my presentation is going to be very short. So if we move to the next slide, please. So as Isabella mentioned in her presentation, uh, this uh, work started back in 2020. That was the year that we were preparing uh, the, to launch the new uh, 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 funding program for Eastern Innovation, which is now called Horizon Europe. And as you can see, the duration is between 2021 and 2027. And we're talking about a total budget, budget of around 100 billions of euros. So back then in 2020, we were starting preparing the, present, the, the, the preparation uh, to launch the new framework program. And the discussion started uh, happening on how we can actually make sure that we use all the available tools in our hand in order to be able to monitor and evaluate the program. As you can see, the program is quite um, large. It tackles uh, cl climate change. It uh, helps to boost the EU's competitiveness and growth also achieve UN Sustainable Development Goals. If we move to the next slide. So following an internal discussion as all the great things are happening in the commission, it was decided that we need to uh, use uh, grand IDs uh, for Horizon Europe. Now, the overall purpose was that the, issue, the, the commission will contribute to the general de development of uh, persist persistent identifiers through a mid and long-term time scale. So it's a longer vision that we have for using these um, uh, DOIs. Now, also uh, this, uh, this effort with available persistent identifier will become an important factor for staying evaluating of RNI policies. Because as you can imagine, spending all this amount of money that it's European citizens' money, we need to be able to um, explain how, be transparent, and make the link between the, uh, the funding and the policies that we put in place. Next slide, please. Now, the key use case, as I mentioned before, is the evaluation and monitoring of especially the impact of the framework program. Because in the end, this is why we have available this program to monitor, um, to, to uh, let's say, have an impact in the society and our research and innovation in Europe. Now, the idea is, of course, that better links between grants and publications will allow us to uh, see exactly where this money was spent, what we got out of it, what was the output, can be patents, prototypes of software components, and make sure that we follow the link and we can report on what came out of this program, which is very important for us in terms of our obligations to the European citizens. Now, the final objective, of course, is that a simplified analysis will be able to uh, be performed when the link is declared via a persistent identifier instead of a free form text. Now, what maybe you are not aware of is that we are also already uh, in a discussion on the next framework program. And these kind of persistent identifiers are very are key to this discussion. And that sums up my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicolaus. Uh, lovely. And thank you for kind of shedding some light also about how uh, this fits in the bigger picture for you, because I think that's often uh, that is that's easily forgotten in the uh, tackling of the technical uh, processes that are uh, that need to be undertaken to um, implement uh, a, a new system, especially at such a scale, I think. All right, so I just wanted to check uh, if there are any questions um, to, uh, to Nicolaus or Paola about um, the European Commission's uh, grant I, uh, DOIs. Since there aren't any questions appearing by themselves as yet, I wanted to take a quick opportunity because uh, I think I wasn't around when that uh, process has started. So obviously we have three different speakers covering this topic, and I believe that that is probably because of the complexity and the number of organizations and different parts of the bodies involved in the process itself. Um, may I just ask kind of how, 
obviously we have had the explanation of how the process has taken place. Uh, how long did it take to get all the different pieces to collaborate and um, and implement this smoothly? How long did it take for such an immense program to implement grant, grant DOIs, please? Well, although I was not working for a recent innovation back then, but uh, my understanding is that it took a couple of months and maybe even, even a year to make sure that everything would be in place. Because if I'm not mistaken, I mean, the number is uh, around uh, covering 50% of the registered DOIs uh, currently for grants, if I'm not mistaken. So you can imagine that we're talking about a massive amount of, of DOIs. Now, um, my, 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 from my discussion, I understood that it took a couple of months and even maybe reaching a year because we also wanted to make sure that we have a clear structure by pillar of the funding that we are having under each program. And keep in mind that I talk about Horizon Europe, which is the current framework program, but in the past, we had also to do it also, in the beginning, we had to do it also for Horizon 2020, which was the, the previous framework program. As uh, Isabella mentioned in her presentation, we are still discussing how far we can go in the past in order to assign grants, uh, DOIAs for the grants in the past. But this, as you can imagine, is less in our priority comparing to the current and the previous program that we have in place. But indeed, it was a massive effort and it took a lot of uh, time for several colleagues, several services. As you can understand, uh, the, the, my, my director general is working together with OP, which is the main public uh, service uh, dealing with the uh, publication of uh, data and information. So yeah, it was it was a journey, but I think um, the added value is quite uh, evident and around us. And I think that this work also will fit in the next uh, framework program discussions. Yeah, if I, if I may add, as I was involved uh, since the very beginning, actually, as Nicolaus said, the effort was uh, huge, especially before uh, the implementation. So all the work that has been done within the, the, the groups within the EU Commission and with Crossref as well to define which were the requirements and which were the, 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 the real uh, key uh, aspects uh, to include in the DOI registration, the workflows internally and externally took longer than the actual implement implementation of some APIs and mappings. Uh, that, that's always as it works. Good specification and requirements uh, leads to quick implementations. Lovely, thank you, Paula, and thank you, Nicolas, as well. We had one more question. I think that the hand is now down, but Luis uh, Montella, if you wanted to ask your question, please, uh, I think I can give you one more minute to, to do that. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, no, thank you. I just did it by accident. Okay. <laughs> All right, okay, <laughs> one more, one more of those. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, in that case, uh, if there are any more questions, uh, please uh, do go ahead and um, and share them on the community forum. We'll also have um, a larger discussion about the research nexus itself and all the different connections. We've, there was a few different cases for those discussed today. Um, later, uh, I think it will be at 1 p.m. UTC. So obviously everybody needs to check their own time zone, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, so if you wanted to discuss further about, for example, usefulness of such relationships with grants and works and institutions and other actors and, and um, artifacts in the scholarly ecosystem, then please join the discussion as well later on. Now, thank you to all the panelists um, and uh, especially to those who have also provided the posters that are on our community forum. Uh, you can go and uh, everybody can go and, and explore um, more about those topics. And as I said in the beginning, we will be sharing the slides and the recordings. So you can also remind yourself after the event about this, uh, about the content. Thank you very much. And thank you to all who uh, joined us. Uh, we'll now um, soon move on to the next session. Paul has already uh, given you the link to join the next session, which will start uh, at the full hour, uh, and it will be the demonstrations of the different projects and products uh, from Crossref and our partners. All right.